So the title of my talk is Foundations of Transmathematics, Turtles All the Way Down. And Turtles All the Way Down refers to an ancient concern with explanations. So ancient people had worked out that the earth must be in the sky somewhere. And they asked the question, what holds the earth up? And at the time, their view was that the earth was flat. And the answer they gave, I don't know how they arrived at it, was that the earth was held on the back of four giant elephants. And then the question arises, well, what holds the elephants up? And the answer they arrived at, and again, I don't know how, is that the elephants were held on the back of a turtle. And then the question arises, what holds the turtle up? And the answer they gave was, it's turtles all the way down. Now, in modern mathematics, we're quite happy with the idea of a recursion that goes on forever. In computer science, we'd really rather like the recursion to be finite so that we can compute it. And what I want to do in this talk is go over the different areas of the foundations of transmathematics that I've explored, uh, because I now think that I've covered all of the different of areas of foundation that I want to. Uh, oh, come on. So I'll talk a little bit about to totality and then raise the issue of how the physical universe re relates to abstract thinking. And this is not going to be philosophical. This is going to be from the point of view of computer science. Computer scientists know a lot of how to make physical computers that do something that would require thinking if people did it. I will review projective geometry, which is where transreal arithmetic started. And in these reviews, I'm thinking of writing a book about trans mathematics and going over all of the foundations that I've explored. I guess, in my life. Um, so the next one I'll talk about is a monad. And this is the Perspex. And it explains how to build a robot. We then get to some interesting bottom turtle, which is physics, the applications of transmathematics to physics. I'll mention some new work that's recently been published on the Transdedekin cut. And that is a very interesting result that says there is the identical foundation for the reals and the transreal numbers. Uh, as you may know, I spend some time uh, relating, pointing out the differences between IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic and transreals. At one time, people said transreals and floating point arithmetic were the same or similar, and they're not at all. And uh, from time to time, I point out some differences. And today, I'm going to point out some of the successes and failures of logic when it's applied to floating point arithmetic. And then the new part is transsets. I've been trying to generalize beyond arithmetic to the whole of mathematics. I've had a go at transsets before, but I'd like to share with you what I'm doing now. And transsets are going to be a semantic set theory, not a syntactic one. They're a meta theory. I build them on top of any existing set theory. And the interesting feature they have is that they have unlimited comprehension. So they're total in the sense that you can use any sentence at all from logic to define a set. And that has been done before in set theories. I have a, another way of doing it. And then we'll end with the summary and conclusions. So totality, if we're serious about totality, we should aim to explain everything. Uh, and I am serious about totality. That's why, for example, Transmathematica is a multidisciplinary journal. We'll discuss anything to do with totality. 
The universe is our bottom turtle. All of our expressions end up ultimately as physical things, writing on paper, vibrations of air in space as we talk, whatever. Let me put some philosophical objections to bed. If we're deceived by a demon or we're agents in a simulation, our view of the physical universe is mistaken, but we still adopt the material assumption that there is some physical reality underlying demons or simulators. And I'm not going to spend any more time on those objections than that. My personal ambition is to provide a total foundation for transmathematics. Transmathematics is the mathematics of total systems. So I'm going to review um, various foundational works I've done and propose a new set theory. So the idea of turtles all the way down is to look at recursive explanations that end up in the physical universe. And computer scientists know a lot about the physical universe and how to make computers. So we know how to melt sand, turn it into one molecule, which the chemists find quite surprising. And then we cut this molecule up and turn it into computer chips. We know how to protect the computer chips from cosmic radiation. We know an awful lot about the physical world and how to make computers. And we know a lot about bit patterns. We can make bit patterns out of charge. We can make them out of uh, magnetic domains. We can make them out of phase transitions in uh, all sorts of materials. Uh, CDs, for example, are plastic, which may or may not have dyes in them. Now, working with bit patterns is too time consuming. It's too detailed. So computer scientists have the notion of an abstract data type. And we produce compilers that let us talk in a language that deals with abstract data types. So the idea of an abstract data type is that it encapsulates the semantics of something and we don't need to worry about how the bit patterns manipulate. We can manipulate the thing as an abstract data type and that saves a huge amount of work and it makes it possible in a practical sense to write programs. Now I'll particularly point out bit patterns and abstract data types because I'm going to take those up again when I look at floating point arithmetic. And we'll see that the treatment of bit patterns and abstract data types in floating point arithmetic is different. And that's a problem because it's not supposed to be different. We're supposed to be able to do abstract data types without worrying about bit patterns, but with floating point arithmetic, you have to worry about the bit patterns. What is totality? Well, if we're, if we're serious, a total compiler would convert any input text, regardless of whether it's well or badly formed, and it would convert it into an executable program. And I would hope that if the text I provide is rubbish, the compiler will give me some warnings. But the notion is that there shouldn't be any input text which is illegal in a total system. We should be prepared to compile anything. And in set theoretical terms, that maps onto the idea of unlimited comprehension. Any sentence at all will define a set. Right, let's have a look at projective geometry, which is where the transreal started. In the middle, I've marked up the projection point as capital Phi got two white lines going through it. Those are the projective rays. They pass through the projection point. The red arrows represent uh, an object, and an object gets turned upside down on the other side of the projection point. The, in projective geometry, the horizon occurs at infinity. So at the moment, these labels are the labels of projective geometry. Infinity is a horizon capital Phi is the projection point. Now, there are many different ways of dealing with projective geometry, but broadly speaking, mathematicians and computer scientists do it in two different ways. 
So many mathematicians work with the point at infinity with infinity unsigned. This is very much like uh, the unsigned infinity of wheels. And the projection point, phi, is punctured from space. It's removed from space. Now, computer scientists do it differently as a rule. We use two copies of the mathematician's space. We have a double cover of projective space. And in one of the copies, we arrange to draw all of the objects that are in front of the camera. And in the other copy, we draw all of the objects that are behind the camera. So now we're distinguishing between in front and behind. Projective geometry doesn't do that. Projective geometry doesn't care whether you're in front or behind. Computer scientists do care. Uh, then we throw away the copy behind the camera <coughs> and draw just what's in front of the camera. And that lets us do computer graphics. It lets us make movies where you can see what's in front of the camera. And an important difference is that computer scientists don't throw away the projection point. The projection point is very important to a computer scientist. It's the position where the camera is. So mathematicians see projective geometry always as relative to the camera, whereas computer scientists allow the camera to occupy a position in space. And this means there is a fundamental difference between the ways that mathematicians and computer scientists do projective geometry. For mathematicians, projective geometry is partial. It's partial over points because one point, capital Phi, is excluded. And for computer scientists, projective geometry is total. Every point is included. Right. It turns out that transreal arithmetic is consistent with the computer graphics approach. So what I've labeled plus and minus infinity as points on the horizon in projective geometry turn exactly into transreal plus and minus infinity. And the projection point, which I've labeled capital Phi in projective geometry, turns exactly into nullity. So projective geometry, as computer scientists do it, provides a faithful model of transreal arithmetic. I actually came at it the other way around, of course. I was solving problems in computer vision using projective geometry, and I worked with the geometry and derived the arithmetic from it. Now, the fact that we have a total system makes a difference. So in projective geometry, convergent lines intersect at a finite point. Parallel lines intersect at infinity. And skew lines don't intersect anywhere. So in projective geometry, if you ask the question, where do skew lines intersect, there is no answer. So intersection is a partial function in projective geometry as mathematicians do it. For computer scientists, though, there is an answer. Uh, and the answer is that skew lines meet at the projection point. Now, geometrically, this is obvious. Every line in projective space intersects at the projection point. So they're defined that way. They're defined to pass through the projection point. So the rays are defined to pass through, and that means the images of lines drawn in space pass through. What's a little bit surprising is that if you write down the homogeneous equations for the intersection of lines, then they calculate skew lines meet at a point with homogeneous coordinates 0 over 0, which is, of course, nullity. And the question is, why does that happen? Because when these formulas were worked out for calculating the intersection of formula of lines, no one had thought about the point at nullity. And the reason is that the, we're now working with a total system of arithmetic. If the lines were convergent, they would intersect at a finite point. If the lines were parallel, they would intersect at an infinity. If the lines are skew, then they do not intersect at a finite point or at infinity, they intersect somewhere else. 
And there is only one point left over in projective space where they can intersect, and that's nullity. And that's telling us that in a total system, argument by exclusion is very powerful. It's giving us results that we didn't know, and it's totalizing the concept of intersection. So right from the off, transreal arithmetic describes how the physical universe looks. We've touched our bottom turtle in the sense that we know what the turtle looks like. Let's move on now to the moon man, monad. The perspective simplex or perspex provides everything needed to build an intelligent robot, but we don't know how to build one. It provides all the ingredients, but we don't know the recipe. So what is a perspex? Well, it's a four by four matrix of homogeneous coordinates with ve um, column vectors X, Y, Z, and T, and rows one, two, three, and four. So that's what it is, but it can be used in many ways. So one way is to use those vectors to define a tetrahedron. And a tetrahedron can be used to cut up many shapes in three dimensions. Uh, we are quite happy for our tetrahedron to be de degenerate, to be a plane, a line, or a point. And if we could do that, we can describe any shape at all in three dimensions. If we wanted more dimensions, we'd have to work a bit harder. So the perspex describes the shape of objects in the physical universe. Uh, the perspex can be a general linear transformation, uh, in which case it can describe how the parts of an ob a robot move, how its arms move, how its legs move, if it's got any, uh, and it can describe the motion of objects in the world. So now the monad also describes motion in the physical universe. And the perspex can describe a projective transformation. Here, F is the focal point. This describes a very simple um, perspective transformation. It corresponds to pinhole camera, which is what I showed you on the first slides about projective geometry. There are more complicated versions of this matrix, which will describe any of the um, interesting and nonlinear um, physics that goes on in a real lens. But uh, the monad describes how the physical universe looks. Well, the monad can also be described as a, an artificial neuron, which reads its data from positions x and y, performs some calculation and writes the result to the position z, and then jumps to some of the components in t. And it could jump to any combination of T1, 2, 3, and 4. Conveniently, having four places to jump to corresponds to the idea of quadricotomy in transreal numbers. So we might choose to jump to T1 if the result is less than 0, T2 if it's equal to 0, T3 if it's greater than 0, and T4 if it's nullity. Uh, a couple of my students liked the idea of the perspex and they wrote a C compiler. So this reads the C language and it produces perspex neurons. Uh, and one of the students did the graphical user interface. What you're seeing on the right is the compilation of Dijkstra's, Dijkstra's algorithm. So Dijkstra's algorithm was written down in C uh, and it generates this. And this network actually calculates um, the nearest cities. There is actually a movie um, on the web of it processing that calculation. So now the monad can describe computer programs in the physical universe. Well, that's all fun. Uh, it's rather abstract and hasn't yet made contact with physics, but you might expect that we can get to physics if we can describe the shape and position of objects, how they move and what they look like. So a bit later on, I took on Newton's laws of motion and uh, found that transreal arithmetic, of course, its total system can be used to write down Newton's laws of motion. 
And when you do that, you find that Newton's laws of motion work exactly at singularities. The whole of real analysis has been extended to transreal analysis. So we can solve lots of physical problems with transreal numbers. And the whole of complex analysis has been extended to trans-complex analysis, except for the trans-complex derivative. And that exception makes it hard to solve some physical problems. We do know specific cases of the trans-complex derivative. So we can usually solve a physical problem if we have to, but it would be nice to know what the general trans-complex derivative is. When physicists tell you uh, they're working on black holes and they've got a singularity and mathematics doesn't work at the singularity, so they can't tell you anything about the black hole, they're being lazy. If they use transmathematics, it would not break down at the singularity and they could tell you something about it. Now, physics usually assumes continuity or imposes boundary conditions, especially at singularities. But we're in a different position. We can calculate the physical properties exactly at a singularity and in the approach to the singularity. And that means we can test a transmathematical function, some equation of physics, to see if it is continuous or discontinuous at a singularity. We can find out. We don't have to impose a boundary condition. And that means we can discover more about the mathematics of physical laws than is possible with the usual mathematics. Our mathematics, transmathematics, is more expressive. It can answer questions that ordinary mathematics cannot answer. Right, well, we've got the number nullity. Um, Walter certainly puzzled about nullity earlier in the conference. Thiago described nullity in terms of hyperreal numbers. We'd like to know what nullity does in physics. And we can get that from the topology of the transreal number line. So I've drawn the real number line as a solid white line after a gap that's plus and minus infinity. And then off that extended real number line is nullity. And you can see that nullity has zero projection in the real and extended real spaces. Nullity is isolated off in its own dimension. It doesn't project into extended real space. And that tells us that a nullity force behaves as if it were a zero force if we measure it in the universe we live in, which is certainly the real universe, maybe the extended real universe. And knowing how transreal arithmetic describes forces is a Rosetta Stone. It lets you translate it into other physical quantities, such as energy, um, such as working out charge fields, such as working out um, uh, fields in quantum field theory. Anything, I think, anything physical quantity, we can get to via the topology of the transreal number line. Right, well, we um, had a bold hypothesis. Newton said <coughs> that uh, science advances with new bolder hypotheses. We applied the transreal Newtonian physics to a black hole, bit of a silly thing to do, as we know it's um, governed by Einsteinian physics, but at least it tells us something. And what it told us was there is a massive convection current that passes through the singularity of a black hole. And we're able to calculate that using physics. Uh, and the transreal version of it. And that's something that couldn't be done with ordinary mathematics. You couldn't calculate what happens exactly at the black hole. Now, having done that calculation, we hypothesize that um, the event horizon is perturbed by the convection current. The convection current is massive. It's got mass. In fact, it has all of the mass that's inside the black hole. So there's a lot of mass. And the 
precise way that that mass falls into and through the singularity gets reflected in the boundary of the black hole. So a black hole, according to this calculation and hypothesis, isn't a perfect sphere, far from it. The surface looks like a, a sort of roiling surface of a pot of boiling water. It has high points, it has low points, and those follow where the mass is moving inside the black hole. And that means that when Hawking radiation occurs, it is giving you information about the shape of the um, material that's in the convection current. Now, there is an issue with time dilation. It's going to take this um, convection current is going to take a mighty long time. But at every point in the lifetime of the black hole, I claim information is radiating out of the black hole. And as gas falls into the black hole, it might come close to a bump on the surface and get heated up quite a lot. Uh, and then the bump might move away, the gas might move away. It can cool down by radiating its energy and then get heated up again. So one of the predictions we make is that the gas falling into a black hole heats monotonically. It gets hotter and colder as it goes in. Now, that's an extremely sketchy set of calculations and hypotheses, but it makes the point that transreal arithmetic is empirically testable. We did a calculation in transreal arithmetic. We made some predictions that are different from the predictions you would get if you used real arithmetic, and now it's up to astronomers uh, or maybe particle physicists to tell us if our prediction is right. In the case of particle physicists, uh, if you could make a black hole, I claim it will evaporate faster than Hawking says. So it's empirically testable. We've touched the bottom turtle in terms of physics. Right, let's look at the Dedekin cut. I find it amazing that the real numbers were formalized as late as the 20th century. And they were formalized by Dedekind, and he did it this way. He considered partitions of the rational numbers. And he partitioned the rational numbers into two sets, a lower set L and an upper set U. And these have the property that every element in the lower set is smaller, less than every element in the upper set, which was why it's called the lesser set, the lower set. Uh, the upper set, of course, all of its elements are bigger than the elements in the lower set, and that's why it's called the upper set. And then a stroke of absolute genius on Dedekind's part, the lower set has no greatest element. And astonishingly, that lets you move from a set, the rationals, to a bigger set, a set with a higher cardinality, the reals. And um, we could talk about why that happens, but it does happen and it's very cute. Now, Dedekind made an assumption. He said that the partition is partitioned into non-empty sets. He wouldn't allow you to have an empty set for L. He wouldn't allow you to have an empty set for U. And he then derived real arithmetic by giving an arithmetic of the cuts. So Dedekind sets up his cuts, he defines an arithmetic of the cuts, he outlaws the partitions with empty sets and obtains real arithmetic. Well, what Tiago and I did was say, we're going to allow those sets that Dedekind disallowed. And we're going to give them names. We're going to call the first of these sets, which has an empty lower part and a full upper part, we're going to call that minus infinity, because that represents a cut, which is where every rational number is bigger than it. So it seems a natural way to describe minus infinity. And we're going to call infinity the cut, which is bigger than all rational numbers. 
Now vector identification has been done before in mathematics and it is said to give rise to extended real arithmetic. That statement is okay insofar as it goes, um, but it doesn't go very far because extended real arithmetic isn't formalized. It's, there's a list of expectations about what extended real arithmetic does, and authors differ on what they expect. Transreal arithmetic, of course, says there is one interpretation of minus infinity infinity, and um, those things exactly obey the rules of transreal arithmetic. And then we added the cut, which has an empty lower set and an empty upper set, the, the cut nullity. And these cuts are total. We've considered every possible partition of the rational numbers. We defined a transdedekind arithmetic and discovered that it describes real arithmetic and transreal arithmetic. So now we're in the position where the total set of cuts identically provides a foundation for real and for transreal arithmetic. So real and transreal arithmetic now have the identical foundation. Of course, real arithmetic is partial. It disallowed those three cuts. It dis and as a consequence, it disallows division by zero. Dedekind was remarkably insightful in disallowing those partitions in order to outlaw division by zero. And because it dif outlaws division by zero, it has an infinite number of error states. Transreal arithmetic is total. <coughs> it allows division by zero and has no error states. So given the choice that you have an identical foundation for transreal and real arithmetic, you may choose between using real arithmetic with an infinite number of error states or transreal arithmetic with no error states. And I maintain that it's perverse to choose real arithmetic. Why would you choose the arithmetic that has an infinite number of errors when you can equally well choose the set transreal arithmetic that doesn't have any errors at all? Right, the transdedekind cut is a sufficient foundation for transreal arithmetic. I'm very happy that we've found the bottom turtle of transreal arithmetic in mathematics. Tran the transdedekind cut has been expressed in the set theory ZFC. In fact, all of the results of transmathematics have been expressed using the usual set theory ZFC. The transdedekind cut could be expressed in any of the usual set theories. You could use NFU, you could use GNB, you could use anything you feel like. And in particular, it would be possible to express the transdedekind cut in the new set theory I'm going to talk about. Right, let me spend a few minutes talking about floating point arithmetic. All of the logics used in computer science and most of the logics used in mathematics obey the law of identity. If there is any computer scientist using a logic that doesn't obey the law of identity, I would love to know what they are doing. Anyway, the law of identity states for all x, it is the case that x is equal to x. The law of identity holds for bit patterns and hence for all concrete data types. So the concrete data type float is logical. You can do things like specify what the bit patterns should do. You can verify to discover if a particular system behaves correctly. But IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic has that for all indexes i and for all variables x, the ith noun is not equal to x even if x is the ith nan. So the ith nan not equal to the ith nan breaks the law of identity. And that means that logic does not apply to it. Hence the abstract data type float is illogical. By illogical, I mean logic does not apply. 
Now, most of the logics used in computer science and mathematics obey the law of non-contradiction. <coughs> A few computer scientists use laws that don't obey the law of non-contradiction. They use paraconsistent logics and they do it in order to describe databases that may have inconsistent data in it. It's a very cute application of a paraconsistent logic. Anyway, the law of non-contradiction says it is not the case that some proposition P is both true and not true. The law of non-contradiction holds for bit patterns and hence for all concrete data types. And hence the concrete data type float is logical. Logic applies to it. You can specify a program in the floating point bits. You can verify a program in the floating point bits. But IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic has minus zero is equal to zero and one over zero is not equal to one over minus zero. But one over zero is not equal to one over minus zero implies that zero is not equal to minus zero. So now we have minus zero equals zero and minus zero is not equal to zero, which is a contradiction. It breaks the law of contradiction. Hence the abstract data type float is illogical. It is not possible to specify a floating point program that uses the abstract data type float. It's not possible to verify that such a program is correct. Right, IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic has a predicate called total order that can be used to order all floats. Total order specifies a unique order for the bit patterns. The negative nands occur before the real numbers, the real numbers occur before the positive nands. And total order produces a total order of bit patterns so concrete floats are well ordered. And that's a very good thing. But each NAN has two bit patterns, one positive bit pattern and one negative bit pattern. Hence, every abstract NAN occurs before and after every float, including itself. So total order doesn't produce a total order of abstract floats because the abstract floats are not well ordered. It's impossible to order them. And that's a bit of a problem if you want to write a sorting algorithm. You are not going to be able to do it in terms of the abstract data type float. If you want to do it at all, you would have to specify the bit patterns that you want, the operations on the bit patterns you want in the sorting routine. So IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic is specified in bit patterns and is logical. It is possible to specify IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic programs at the bit level. Uh, if you want to specify a practical program, floating point program at the bit level, you will succeed, but you might die of old age before you've finished. Uh, if you want to verify a floating point program in terms of its bits, verify it at a bit level, the universe might die of old age before we finished. The abstract data type float is illogical. In general, it's impossible to specify IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic programs in terms of the abstract data type float, and it's impossible to verify them. It's impossible to specify or verify them because logic does not apply to them. And there's a practical consequence of that. Most programmers do not work at the bit level when they're writing floating point programs. They write at the abstract level and hence their programs are illogical and have bugs. I don't think I've ever seen a floating point program written by somebody else that didn't have a bug in it. It is possible to write floating point programs that don't have bugs. If you read a float, copy it and write it, that can be bug free. Those operations are all occurring at the bit level. So I've explained to you why abstract floats are illogical uh, and you can demonstrate it to yourself. As an exercise, create an array of IEEE 754 floats that has some occurrences of real numbers, some occurrences of zero, of minus zero, and some nans, and distribute those around. Um, put real numbers between these things. 
and then sort it and sort it with different sorting algorithms, including the built-in sorting routines. And the reason I say to use the built-in sorting routines is you would hope that the built-ins will work. Uh, you know they can't possibly work because the arithmetic is illogical. And you will find that it is impossible to predict, in general, it's impossible to predict the output of the program. Of course, if your array has no elements, you know what the output is. If the array has one element, you know what the output is. After that, it gets tricky. So IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic, the abstract floats are illogical and dangerous. Now, transreal arithmetic does obey the law of identity and it does obey the law of non-contradiction. So it um, is a much better foundation for floating point arithmetic. And indeed, there is one design for a floating point arithmetic processor that uses transreal arithmetic. Using a logical foundation for floating point arithmetic would be a radical departure for computer scientists and numerical analysts. Okay, let's move on. We are now convinced that floating point arithmetic is very, very different from transreal arithmetic. I would like to have a total system of mathematics that's well defined for all formulas, regardless of whether they're well or badly formed. I want total uh, unlimited comprehension over all formulas, not just all well formed formulas. Now, real arithmetic isn't sufficient because it, x over zero doesn't exist. Uh, let me pick up Jan's point and be very clear about this. The formula x over zero occurs in real arithmetic, but it can't be evaluated into any real number. Transreal arithmetic allows x over zero, but it's not sufficient because it doesn't allow x greater than zero, x le less than and greater than zero. Let's be very clear. The formula x is greater than zero, x is less than zero exists, but it doesn't have a solution in transreal arithmetic. Now we could use a set theory ZF and write we want the set of all x such that x is greater than zero and less than zero, and that evaluates the empty set, which is fine. But we can't write down the set x such that x is not a member of x. That gives us the Russell paradox. The set theory BMG is a stronger set theory. It does allow us to write down x such that x is not a member of x, uh, but its operations are not total overall sets and proper classes. In particular, you can't find the subset of any proper class. And I would like everything about the set theory to be total. I want all operations to apply to everything. So I'm looking for a set theory that allows us to write x such that phi of x for all formulas phi of x, regardless of whether phi of x is well or badly formed. So I'm going to take a computer scientist approach to this. I'm going to adopt any base set theory and write it in square brackets. I'm going to adopt the base logic or whatever that set theory uses, usually first order predicate calculus. And I'm going to adopt the Boolean values true and false. So I'm ex accepting any set theory as my base language. And then I'm going to define transets in terms of that base language. And I'll write transets with Latin braces. Uh, this won't do any harm because it will turn out that all of the ordinary sets are also transets. So transset theory is a meta set theory expressed in a set theory. We need two axioms to pull off this trick. Um, so the first one is the axiom of Boolean quadricotomy for all formulas phi of x for a given x, regardless of whether a formula is well or badly formed, it is the case that the set which contains all the evaluations of phi of x is exactly one of just true which is the set with just t in it. That's why it's called just true. It could be just false, which is the set with just false in it. That's why it's called just false. 
It could be a contradiction which contains T and F, which is why it's called a contra contradiction, or it could be a gap, a set with no elements, the empty set. And notice that I've just formalized what a gap is. So a gap occurs in many kinds of logic, not least in paraconsistent logics, and I've now formalized it. I've told you that it is a set with no truth values. And here's our second axiom, the axiom of transset membership. X is a member of a transset if and only if all of the evaluations of the formula phi of X are just true. And we can gloss that in English. X is a member of a transect if and only if it's just true that X is a member of the transect. So transect theory is not a syntactic theory, it's a semantic theory. And that has advantages and disadvantages, <coughs> but it provides exactly what I want to totalize trans mathematics. As we add uh, axioms in order to deal with Gödel's incompleteness theorems, transect theory will be unperturbed by that. All we're doing is changing the base language on which transets are based. So that's why I did it. It buys me immunity to developments in mathematics. By semantic definition, transets are immune to paradoxes of contradiction and paradoxes of logical non-existence, in other words, gaps. Transets may be used to reason in the face of contradictions and gaps in knowledge, making them a candidate to explain scientific reasoning. Scientists are often in a position where there's stuff they don't know, or their reasoning is inconsistent, <coughs> or the theories they're proposing are presently inconsistent, and the inconsistencies need to be ironed out. One puzzle in philosophy and the philosophy of science is how do scientists reason under those circumstances? So I propose transets as one possible way of getting a handle on that. So transets provide a sufficient semantic foundation for the whole of mathematics. And by allowing transets of any mathematical statements, regardless of whether these statements are well or badly formed, consistent or inconsistent. So we can describe not only the good mathematics that professional mathematicians do, but the bad mathematics that schoolboys do when they make errors. Let me give you an example of the usefulness of a badly formed formula. Let hash be a symbol outside the base logic such that any formula involving hash is badly formed. Let phi of x be the formula x equals zero or hash such that phi of hash is a gap. Then x given phi of x is uh, exactly the set zero, we've obtained a precise set despite the fact that phi of x is badly formed. Let me give you an example of the usefulness of a contradictory formula. Let r sub naught, r naught, be the set x given x is not a member of x. That's a little paradox. Um, now r naught contains all sets which unambiguously do not contain themselves, including all Zamello ordinals and all non von Ullmann ordinals, but it doesn't contain itself. Uh, let R1 equal R0 union. Let, okay, let R1 be the set of all of the elements of R0 together with R0 itself. If it's the case that R1 contains R1, then R1 is not a member of R0, and we're perfectly happy with that. We're perfectly happy that we've now produced a set of all sets that don't contain themselves, this set called R1, and it does contain itself. That's fine because our definition was arrived at in two set steps. First, we constructed the set of all sets that unambiguously do not contain themselves, and then we put them together into R1. If it's the case that R1 does, doesn't contain R1, then R1 is already a member of R0, but by construction, R1 isn't equal to R0, so again, we're satisfactory. Uh, I would actually like to know which one of these two cases hold. Uh, and if I'm going to develop transreal arithmetic, I'd like to dissolve the paradoxes of the greatest ordinal in ZFC. 
If you look at some of my archived papers, you'll see I can already do that. Um, but it's useful to set it up as a goal in uh, an official paper. Oh, somebody's asking to be admitted. Um, right, so transset theory is a semantic metaset theory built on any syntactic set theory. Transets totalize all syntactic set theories. We may have transets of all formulas of mathematics, and hence we can totalize the whole of mathematics, making it trans mathematics. I'd like to collaborate with um, people on developing this set theory. So in summary, I'm getting short on time, I need to bang on. Uh, more work is possible on computer systems from the current foundation, on projective geometry, on the perspex. We could do a lot more work in physics. The trans dedekind cut provides an excellent foundation for trans real arithmetic in the usual set theories and in trans set theory. Uh, IEEE 754 floating point arithmetic is degenerate, and trans real arithmetic would provide a better foundation for floating point arithmetic. Trans sets allow unlimited comprehension, thereby totalizing the whole of mathematics. And after writing the conference paper corresponding to this talk, I intend to write a book. It's very useful to revise, uh, reread everything that one's done before. Uh, in conclusion, Transdedic and Cut is an excellent foundation for trans real and real arithmetic in the usual set theories and in trans set theory. But I maintain that using real arithmetic is perverse. IEEE 754 is degenerate. Trans real arithmetic would be a better foundation. Transsets are a semantic metaset theory, which might totalize the whole of trans mathematics. A great deal of work needs to be done to settle that question. Uh, if we do that, we turn the whole of mathematics into trans mathematics. We totalize the whole of mathematics. There are other ways of totalizing the whole of trans math of mathematics, um, but this is the approach I'm taking. And let me be bold. Our society relies on real arithmetic but real arithmetic has an infinite number of error states. So every scientific, technological and computational enterprise is guaranteed to fail somewhere. And if you want a society that's not guaranteed to fail, then switch from using real numbers to trans real numbers. Okay. Let me zap that. Uh, let me admit Chris. Okay, questions, folks. James. Sorry, Steve has raised oh, okay. <laughs> Steve. I, I've got loads of questions. Um, I think the first question I, I want to check is you talk about there being an infinite number of errors. Yes. Uh, could you spell out what you mean by these different errors? Sure. Uh, it, the, the infinite number of errors. So there are an infinite number of formulas in real arithmetic which are an error state. For example, one over zero, two over zero, three over zero, and so on. Okay. Uh, let, let's have Jan ask his question. We'll come back to you because you said you had many questions. Jan. Yeah, so you suggest that um, physics could decide somehow, empirical physics, whether or not transreal arithmetic is valid, so to say. I can imagine that this is like non-Euclidean geometry, mm. where uh, general relativity gives a suggestion that this is the preferred thing. Mm. But in the case that you were calculating on, wouldn't it be also possible that you just have another theory of black holes? which could just as well be captured in, uh, in ordinary arithmetic. You just somehow have different equations for black holes and then you get different predictions. Um, you, you could build that. The difficulty you would have is that if you built your equations in real arithmetic, they would fail at the singularity. So you would have to puncture the singularity. You would have to apply a boundary condition that says um, 
on the way into the convection current, it behaves this way. On the way out from the convection current, it behaves this way. And we don't know what happens at the singularity. So yes, you could do that. The way you would have to do it is by imposing arbitrary boundary conditions. Now, transrail arithmetic doesn't work that way. It doesn't impose arbitrary boundary conditions. It says the equations follow transrail arithmetic and the convection current therefore works in this way. And we can tell you what happens to the convection current at nullity. And then it becomes an empirical question. Do black holes work this way? Uh, if blue black holes do work that way, that makes transreal arithmetic useful. If black holes don't work that way, it means that in that circumstance, transreal arithmetic isn't useful. It's still valid as a piece of mathematics. It just doesn't have application to black holes. So, so the difference is that if you can use real arithmetic to get any result of a transreal analysis, but in order to do it, you have to impose arbitrary boundary conditions. And then the worry is how many boundary conditions do you have to impose? Mm -hmm. For example, um, can you guarantee always to use only a finite number of boundary conditions? And would it, is there a much simpler case where, uh, where Trans, transreal arithmetic would be sort of uh, observable in terms of giving different predictions. Well, Chris, Chris, are you around somewhere? Uh, Chris has a an example from electronics where he claims that the an electric field behaves in a way that is explained by transreal arithmetic and is not explained otherwise. Mm. So the onus is on Chris to do the um, transreal analysis. Thiago and I have been helping him develop the mathematical tools in quaternions. That's why we did the quaternion paper. Um, and then it's down to Chris to demonstrate the phenomenon he claims and defend that from the charge people might make that it can be explained by real arithmetic. So there is a possibility. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that dealing with field equations is simpler than dealing with a gravitational singularity. Gravitational singularities are fairly simple things, uh, certainly in Newtonian physics. Um, but in terms of experiment, easier, it's, it's much easier. easier experiment. It's a much easier experiment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easier experiment. <laughs> right. Okay, Steve, you said you had some more questions. Yeah, you, need, you need to put your microphone on. Oh, yeah, as, as always, I do. Yes. Um, so I was quite in, intrigued by, um, a, there's a couple of bits in, in the description about uh, the relationship between concrete and abstract data types. Yeah. Um, and this is just a point really that, that although um, it is true that, that you would expect any two uh, representations of an abstract object that have the same pa bit pattern, to be identical is not it only operates that way around it's not true that um they need to be identical in order to imply equality at the abstract level that's true and the two versions so every noun has a positive and a negative version because they ignore the sign bit and those two versions behave differently in total order so you do in fact get a different behavior for the two versions of what is supposed to be a single abstract thing. Yeah, which is a nonsense. Yeah. Which is nonsense. <laughs> um, and then, that, so that was just kind of a point that, that yeah, I, I thought point. that was not emphasized enough. Mm, um, a fair point. Uh, then um, I was interested in this, in, in, the, in the, um, the idea that, uh, Gap is not absorptive. 
Yes. Uh, is contradiction absorptive? I guess it's much more absorptive. Uh, contradiction is certainly absorptive over true and false. Right. There is a legitimate question whether it's absorptive over gap. And most authors of logic and philosophy, Walter will correct me if I overstate the case, say that gap is absorbs contradictions. So if you have a gap, then everything is a gap. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So I was wondering about mapping it onto the totalization of programs and computations. Um, that, that one could imagine that, that, that true and false represent end states of a, of a program and gap would represent nonsense, uh, just as your mathematical formula. Yeah. If that was nonsense, you interpreted that as gap. Similarly, if we had a program that was, that was complete rubbish, and we, we tried to compile and the next QCIT, you know, what, what does that correspond to? And, and the answer is some form of non-computation or some form of non-result. Hmm. Um, I was wondering if you spent any time thinking about this sort of analogy, whether or not there's a good interpretation for exceptions or, uh, or a contradiction or whatever. As you can imagine, I have spent a vast amount of time thinking about it since <laughs> a lot of it came to any very good conclusion, um, except to say that gaps are the absence of truth value. And, and that, certainly that formalization appears to be original in the literature of paraconsistent logics. So, so yeah, as for what exceptions are to a program, uh, well, if, if they are a failure of computation, then they will turn into a gap. I, I was wondering if, if a logical interpretation is true means it terminates, false means it doesn't terminate, gap means that means we can't compute it. <laughs> it's it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> and the contradiction would mean it both terminates and doesn't terminate. Which is, in fact, the case that occurs in Turing's proof of incomputability. So he, he shows that you get a contradiction and then says uh, the contradictory state doesn't exist. So mathematics very commonly sets up a logical argument proves a contradiction and then says therefore it doesn't exist so boolean logic uh, classical logic is in fact total we've got the values true and false non-existence and gap but the non-existence and gap are dealt with as metalogical ideas and only true and false are dealt with as logical it's not quite true some logics have a predicate contradiction James, uh, you have presented in last conference a uh, set theory with uh, trans transects. Yeah. Um, actually, is, uh, have you changed that theory for yes. now? And <laughs> that's a fo following this, question. This is this is where you can put the old theory. <laughs> it's complete rubbish. <laughs> Because uh, in, in some time ago, Walter talked that some logicians mm. asked him about uh, yeah. a foundation in set theory for transmathematics. And my question, my following question is, if you are set theory, uh, find and uh, uh, solve the, the question of the logicians. Okay, so the, the question Walter asked me is, which set is nullity? And we now have a perfect answer to that, that nullity is the empty cut. It's the Dedekind cut, which has an empty left part and an empty right part. So the answer to logicians is nullity isn't a set. There's no set with cardinality nullity. Um, but it is a tuple which can be built on sets. <coughs> and it is precisely the empty Dedekind cut. So the Dedekind cut work 
answers Walter's question. So nullity doesn't occur as an object, as a first class object in the new set theory. Because the new set theory turns every possible formula into a set. And those sets have the usual cardinalities. There's nothing with cardinality nullity. It was always a puzzle how you can have sets with cardinality infinity, that's straightforward, but how do you get cardinality of nullity? And I provided answers to that question in the past, but they weren't very, I believe now, they weren't very good answers. Okay, good, I think. I, I would like to take this opportunity and ask you, Walter. Walter, uh, what do you think about uh, James said about uh, nullities, the empty cut? Do you think that the logicians that talk to you uh, yeah. say would be happy with the? I think it's very interesting to uh, uh, see nullity as uh, the empty cut. I, I have a doubt about it. And I told about it with, with James. I think that uh, there is two different contests, serial numbers and, and trans real numbers. But there is a coincidence that the zero in serial numbers are, uh, uh, also is also defined as an as a empty cut. So uh, my, my question to, uh, to James is how to differentiate serial number zero and nullity. If I am not in uh, within the, the 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 specific context of serial numbers or trans real numbers, yeah. in a naive set theory, the both objects will be the same, or there is some kind of a serial serial number construction that will differentiate such numbers. Uh, and you've guessed the answer. I would use a construction to do it. So I would build. Uh, okay. Um, the surreal numbers out of a structure of cuts and then nullity would occur as a cut inside that structure. So I'd play the computer science game of meta levels of description. So there, there, there are uh, different objects because the context of, 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 of definition. That's right. So Okay. My answer to your logicians would be in the domain of dedicated cuts, nullity is the empty cut. Okay. Uh, and okay. if you pressed me on the domain of serial numbers, I would say something else. It's a particular structure that contains the empty cut. Okay. I think. Uh... I think it's different. Uh, zero in surreal numbers is empty in the sense that, uh, that there is not set in the pair. The pair is empty. But the nullity in terms of the cut, uh, not the pair is empty, it's the pair of empty sets. <laughs> Two empty sets. That, that provides exactly the, the kind of structural answer I would build. Uh, in, in, in serial numbers, the, the zero is defined as uh, the name of a uh, mathematician, Spanish mathematician, Dugara, I don't know, I didn't remember the name of the specific cut. So you have an uh, empty set in the left and empty set in the right side. In trans real numbers, is the same thing or not? Well, again, if, if there was an ambiguity, I would rewrite the theory that's causing the ambiguity. So I would express it as some kind of a structure of something, and then okay. I would put my nullity in as an element of that structure. So I, I can always escape uh, any finite building up of complexity. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's like saying, what is zero? Well, zero is the empty set, yeah. or zero is the empty class. Nobody's going to argue about whether it's a set or a class. Um, in different domains of discourse, it has different values. 
different so this, this kind of question uh, has the, the uh, is made by, by the some kind of philosophical intuition that you have objects uh, outside the language and you have this, this the same object inside the language mm. so i must choose a special kind of language to to deal with objects depending on what kind of language i i, I choose the objects change uh, your it's structure. yeah so I, would the, go, I would go the way tiago goes which says that anything that's isomorphic is interchangeable. So we yes. have a notion of what nullity is in Dedekind cuts, and that's a very precise formal definition. It is this specific cut. And anything that's isomorphic to that is just another way of saying nullity. Yeah. Yeah, that is very interesting the, the way you the the definition of nulls was made very powerful it's a very strong argument that real arithmetic and trans real arithmetic now have an identical foundation yes it's amazing well done tiago <laughs> <laughs> I should add that we both worked on it, of course. <laughs> I like very much this construction of transient numbers from transient cut. And I talk to my colleagues. Uh, I, I am happy to talk. But unfortunately, most of them didn't know Dedekind cut. Amazing. <laughs> so I can't talk about the trans Dedekind cut. <laughs> I don't know why is that. But, uh, I think uh, um, mathematical foundations are not so popular. More, more the, the populations, uh, calculus, but not uh, the foundations. But when the pandemic passes, when we return physically to the universe, I will give an uh, elective course about terms that they can cut. <laughs> I mean, I mean I mean, looking forward, yeah. it, I'm anxious. <laughs> I, I like very much.